could you envisage? I refer here to young viewers, first of all, football of a high level without any substitutions. It's a pretty hard task, isn't it? In order to do it, one must have a really strong, almost unbridled imagination. Meanwhile, the rule itself isn't as ancient as it seems. While substitution during matches was first added to the laws of the game in 1958, it really became the part and parcel of major football in 1968. Before that, this element of spectacle seldom featured in some minor contests and has been perceived rather as an oddity. So why substitutions weren't part of the game for so long, almost for decades? Well, to begin with, it was simply not a custom back in that era, and therefore natural. Secondly, in the 1950s and in the early 1960s, even big clubs had a roster of 15-16 footballers, sometimes just 14, and hence it was a very little room to operate. The ice was broken mainly for the reasons which are at least strange from today's point of view. The introduction of substitution was intended to put an end to ugly tactics when some teams emit leniency, which was so characteristic for the referees of those days, tried to injure and as a result eliminate opponents knowing full well that there won't be a replacement. This disgusting strategy has been particularly popular at the World Cup 1966 in England, when the Portuguese were after the already alien Pele, and in the semi-final match against the West Germany, the Soviet Union, losing Igor Chislenko, who has been sent off, were effectively left with nine men due to Jozef Saba's severe injury. There was another reason. Back at the time, the medals after final matches have been handed only to those 11 players who were on the pitch. As for the rest of the squad, it got absolutely nothing. In order to eradicate all this injustice, since the 1968-1969 season, in European Cups, each team was entitled to make up to two substitutions without a match. A little bit later, in 1970, this rule has been introduced at the World Cup. The novelty proved to be very useful and pertinent, bringing a new dimension of play, even if at the beginning a lot of managers were not in a hurry to use this fresh weapon to its fullest. For example, the famous Mario Zagallo who has been at the helm of the brilliant Brazilian national team that won the 1970 World Cup and wrote to the trophy, made only seven substitutions out of eligible 12 and hardly had any regrets. In fact, all 19 goals of the eventual champions have been scored by the starters, headed by the magnificent Jairzinho, Pile Rivellina and Tostau. As for the coaches of lesser teams, mainly clubs, two available substitutions for them in the 1970s were perhaps even too much, but as long as it was just an option and not an obligatory thing, it's been pretty much okay. This formula lived a long life, 26 years, it's almost an eternity for such a fluid and turbulent environment which football actually is, but in the early 1990s, or rather in the late 1980s, the wind of changes blew again, and with an unheard force, the series of revisions of rules, the prohibition for a goalkeeper to handle the ball after it has been deliberately kicked to him by a teammate was the biggest of them altered the face of football, making it much more attacking, dynamic and intense. On the other hand, the role and importance of clubs grew enormously. This time, the changes were initiated mostly by them. Silvio Berlusconi, 
the owner of AC Milan back at that time, has led to new heights not only his team, but also the other European grandees, by showing them previously unknown opportunities. Having achieved the reduction of the limit for foreign players on the pitch in 1988 in Italy from 2 to 3, in 1992 he went even further and pushed through another mitigation of that rule. From that moment on, the Serie A clubs could have six footballers from abroad in the squad, although still only three of them were allowed to be on the pitch simultaneously. In the form of Fabio Capella, who managed AC Milan in those days, Berlusconi found a like-minded person, winning the Serie A in 1992 in his first full season in charge of the club. Capella instantly started to insist that the squad desperately needs reinforcement, although he already had at his disposal the best team on the continent that went undefeated the whole campaign in the league. The Italian motivated his request by simple fact. In the next season, AC Milan had to back to the international arena after the ill-fated one-year ban, and that meant not only prestige, but also an additional burden in the shape of much more tight fixture. Berlusconi very much respected his wishes by making five high-profile transfers in the summer of 1992, the acquisition of Jean-Pierre Papin, Gianluigi Lentini and Dejan Savicevic were the most notable of them, and brought back from loan Zvanimir Boban and Stefano Nava. Thus, Capella got a roster which comprised almost 25 ambitious players, seven or eight more than coaches used to have in the early 1990s. Such drastic change required an entirely new approach, and the AC Milan tactician became the first one who not only dealt with such a large group of footballers, but also proved to be the man who established new rules for his colleagues. The adamant Fabio started to rotate lineup in each game and emit relentless competition for the places. The usage of two substitutions turned into an automatic, basically mandatory thing. By doing it, Capella at least reduced the number of dissatisfied, making all 20 plus ambitious and hungry for success players happy was completely out of the question. In the situation when the likes of Papen, Rod Gullit, Roberto Donadoni and Alberi Ivani were regularly left out of the squad, as for Boban and especially Savicevic, they were in this unenviable position more often than not. Meanwhile, the other top clubs in Italy and Europe tried to follow AC Milan's footsteps whatever they can, and in such a competitive environment, the change of rules was not long in common. The ever-increasing number of games along with the constant growth of pace and intensity literally dictated a further expansion of substitutions, and in 1994 it has been done, at first in the test regime. Clubs and national sites have been allowed to substitute goalkeeper in addition to two outfield players throughout the match. Then, after this provisional format passed the inspection, in the summer of 1995, the rule with three legitimate substitutions has been affirmed. Despite the apparent insignificance, this correction visibly changed the whole complexion of the game, bringing new ways of thinking and planning. The process of substitutions turned into a game itself, a chess match when both coaches tried to outsmart the counterpart, and frequently the one who excelled in it won the whole contest, especially in Italy, where 70 or maybe even 80% of games have been decided at a maximum by one goal difference. The country, which has been a trendsetter in the world of football for more than a decade, it was there that previously used during substitutions wooden tablets gave way to an electronic scoreboard, 
which we still see today. It was in the autumn of the same 1995, for the record. The difference between impacts that substitutes made before 1995 and after that was as huge and drastic. Just to put it into perspective, from 1995 onwards, within six consecutive years, the fate of at least one major tournament has been decided by the goal scored by a player who came from the bench in the final. It's worth adding that if desired, we could add the 2001 UEFA Cup final to this column, given Robbie Fowler's goal, which technically wasn't a winning one. In 1997, the number of footballers that started the match on the bench has been also increased almost discreetly from 5, the figure that was valid since 1968, to 7, that gave a much wider choice to coaches who now could deploy basically all the best resources and trump cards within a game. Three substitutions became the norm for top clubs and not only, as the way to sustain a high level of intensity and keep all the core of a team involved. In the early 2000s, this effect gradually began to weaken. The reasons of it are transparent. The new substitution rules, little by little, passed into the category of routine, everyday life, in the situation when, unlike the mid-1990s, it was very easy to meticulously study even the minor opponents, it has become much more difficult to spring a surprise. At the same time, football continued to improve in tactical sophistication, and the cases when one manager basically nullified the modification of his counterpart using his own substitutions immediately after that have become more and more frequent. We can use as the most graphic example of it the first leg of the Champions League semi-final in 2006 between AC Milan and Barcelona. The head coach of the hosts, Carlo Ancelotti, whose side was trailing in the middle of second half, decided to refresh the left flank and strengthen the center of midfield in terms of physical presence by bringing there the veteran Paolo Maldini and Massimo Ambrosini respectively. The problem was that the Italian's adversary Frank Reichardt has read this plan beautifully and in his turn threw into the fray Giuliano Belletti and Thiago Motta a few minutes later. As a result, one coach's move has been completely counterbalanced by the response from his foe. And there were many similar cases. On top of that, even by the late 1990s, all major clubs started to rotate the lineup a lot, and under these circumstances, the role of substitutions inevitably had to be reduced. In the meantime, the model with three substitutions proved to be pretty viable, representing the proverbial sweet spot. On one side, it provided a well-needed flexibility and freedom if we take the coach's place. On the other one, this formula kept the solidity of process not allowing things to turn into buffoonery, with chaotic and never-ending changes, and therefore made a favorable difference between official games and the friendly or testimonial ones. The status quo held for almost 25 years, barring the addition of half substitution in extra time, which was valid only for several tournaments and hence went mainly unnoticed, and it took something extraordinary in order to sway the established position. And then it has happened with the arrival of pandemic. As a consequence, the number of permutations has been increased from 3 to 5 in order to lessen the impact of fixture congestion. Initially, this rule was planned as a temporary one, but reality proved to be different and it caught on. Why? Well, the first answer is evident. Extreme circumstances in which it emerged and took root remained. They certainly 
didn't disappear. In addition to it, the new formula is very well corresponding to the supersonic pace of the modern football. And last but not the least, the idea with five substitutions, it's rather a 5 plus 1 mode though, is pretty clever in terms of execution, bearing in mind that head coaches during normal time have only three opportunities to make modifications, excluding those made at half time. So if we think about it, the new regime is a natural continuation of the previous one and it doesn't disturb the flow of the game, which was the main argument of skeptics. The only difference is that, instead of making one substitution in each of those three windows, although the previous rule allowed to send on the pitch three new players at once, managers now have a room to operate and are entitled to throw into the fray a pair of fresh footballers in two of these windows. Moreover, let's not forget that new format brings just an extra option and not an obligation. Managers in general are free to make just three substitutions as it's been before or, this is a radical scenario indeed, could avoid any changes by keeping the starting lineup intact. All this obviously depends on concrete score, the state of particular team, the style of play and head coach's taste, many many variables should be taken into account. No wonder that different specialists interpreted each in its own way. For example, Josep Guardiola over the course of last Champions League campaign used only three and six tenths substitutions on average, leaving on the table basically one third. As for his equally distinguished colleague Zinedine Zidane, he in his last Champions League season to this date was even more radical, using just 36 modifications throughout the games, out of eligible 60. Put another way, free flat per context. There is a huge temptation to suggest that the Frenchman simply didn't know about the new rules. But it most surely wasn't the case. Actually, Zidane made more than three substitutions in several occasions. At the other pole is Julian Nagelsmann, who is eager to use his five substitutions each time. And this term, the German made them 30 out of 30 in the Champions League so far. In short, generally speaking, managers who cultivate an intelligent, and possession type of game are subdued in this sense, trying to not break the natural flow and rhythm of the match, especially if it pan out advantageously. On the contrary, those who bet on pace and resilience tend to bring new players more often, seeking for an extra energy and additional speed. These are comparative observations, of course. The truth is that the new rule means an entirely new mindset and brand new opportunities as well. Chains to change the whole line is arguably the biggest of them. Acting in that manner in the second leg of last year's Champions League semi-final versus Manchester City, Carlo Ancelotti has reversed the situation and won the match which seems to be already lost by bringing the group of young and dynamic players Marco Asensio, Rodrigo and Eduardo Camavinga, instead of the decorated and skillful but static and pretty much tired threesome Casemiro, Toni Kroos, Luka, Modric. By doing it, the Italian effectively changed the face of his team and caught the opponent by surprise. Incidentally, in the previous home games against PSG and Chelsea, when Real Madrid were also on the cusp of elimination, Ancelotti acted in the similar way in the crunch time, keeping in mind how comparable are the main contenders in the Champions League with term and how fresh still this new rule is, I would dare to say that the outcome could be once again influenced by the substitute footballers, very much like it was in the second half of the 1990s. They are on a road now.